Well, the most obvious application of oil is for fuel. And the common fuels are gasoline and diesel, of course. But it's also used in plastic manufacturing. And then there's other applications for cosmetics and lubricants. And what we forget sometimes is how much plastic is in our building materials. So that's extremely important. From ancient times, humans around the planet have used oil for waterproofing, a base for paint. Thicker asphalt base was used for paving roads in ancient times. Let me take you on a journey. I am one of the many thousands looking to make their riches in America's black gold. It's the mid-1860s, and we're in Venango County, Pennsylvania. We know the oil is here. The Native Americans have been using it for centuries. Native Americans dug pits, and as the oil rose to the surface of the water, they would lay down blankets and then wring the blankets out into uh, containers. And we have the tools. We're borrowing that from the fellers that have been pumping salt brine. Salt well drillers were first, trying to harvest salt for food preservation. We can't have bacon without salt. Can't have pickles without salt. The salt well technology was using uh, parts of different technologies developed in China 3,000 years ago. The idea of using a drill bit to pound a hole in the ground. Now, to keep those tools straight in the ground, they built these structures called derricks, which you can see behind me. But there's a greenish scum being found on top of salt brine. Sometimes it comes out black. And when they would reach the brine, sometimes they also reach petroleum. So the crude oil was being produced by salt well drillers, who, for the most part, saw it as a byproduct that was ruining their salt wells. Who wants black salt? <laughs> but the boys down at the lab found this green stuff to be highly flammable. That proves to be exciting for some. Humans around the planet have always disliked darkness. There was a desperate need for a cheap lamp fuel to provide that artificial light for day-to-day, -day, evening, lifetime activities. Whale oil was becoming increasingly expensive. Burning fluids, which often were a mixture of pine tar and alcohol, were extremely explosive. So they were developing a lamp fuel from coal called coal oil. Salt well producers realized that this hydrocarbon that they were finding with their salt could be turned into lamp fuel. But this wasn't new information to everyone. For centuries, Native Americans had been digging for oil all along Oil Creek and the Allegheny River Valley, including French Creek and some of the other tributaries to the Allegheny. And so the first bit of money comes sniffing around. Beginning in 1853, a group of financiers, investors from New York City formed the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company. And through various uh, corporate takeovers that becomes the Seneca Rock Oil Company. The lumber mill owners, Brewer and Watson, that owned this land had uh, become acquainted with these Connecticut and New York City financiers and so worked out a deal to lease their property to mine, bore, dig, etc. for oil. Enter Edwin Drake, a former train conductor who still got some perks of the trade. He meets these financers in a Titusville hotel they all happen to be staying at. He proved to be a useful asset in their search for oil, and they hire him to start drilling. So Edwin Drake was brought here because he had a free railroad pass, paid $1,000 a year salary, and he decided to drill in one of those Native American pits, hoping to find the source of the oil that rose to the surface of the water a decision that happens to benefit the small city of Erie, Pennsylvania. 
With Sawwell technology, you need a steam engine and a steam boiler to provide the power to drill that hole in the ground. So when you see these photographs that show hundreds of derricks, each one of those has an engine and a boiler and an operator to make sure that boiler doesn't explode. Drake buys his engine from Liddell, Marsh, and Hershey in Erie. Within a few years, that becomes the Erie City Ironworks. The Erie City Ironworks becomes one of the major players on West 12th Street in the city of Erie, eventually manufacturing railroad cars as well as marine engines used by the U.S. Navy and other larger shipping companies. Erie was, had all the markings for a, a thriving community before the oil industry was developed. But with the oil industry, it then had refineries. It, its existing steam engine manufacturings quadrupled. You then had several steam engine manufacturers selling their engines and their equipment and tools to the oil field. So Erie blossoms with steam engine manufacturers. A lot easier to get the equipment from Erie than Buffalo, Cleveland, or Pittsburgh. So Drake gets to drilling, but it's slow progress. Three feet per day and frequent setbacks. His financial backers cut off the funding at $2,500. Not the Connecticut financiers, but Drake ended up borrowing money from some Titusville businessmen to keep, uh, keep going with his drilling effort and to continue to feed his family. Drake borrowed $500 to continue his operation. That's a value of roughly $18,000 in 2023. The problem was that water seepage made the ground collapse into the drill shaft, forcing the drillers to have to start over. Drake's solution changed the course of history. He drove a cast iron pipe into the shaft, stopping the well from collapsing as they drilled deeper. And so deeper they went until at 69 feet down, they struck oil. No one knew how much oil was really down in the ground. At 69 and a half feet, all of a sudden Drake was pulling up 25 barrels a day. Just an unheard of quantity of oil. He didn't have enough containers. He even used his, um, the local wash tubs to try to, to find something to hold all this, uh, this magic liquid that was being produced. Edwin Drake was incredibly lucky. If he had drilled 50 feet in either direction, he might not have hit what we call the Drake Stray Sand. It was a very shallow layer of sandstone very narrow in width that produced the oil which he tapped into. But he did tap into it, and boy, did that news travel fast. As soon as Drake struck oil, the story goes that Jonathan Watson jumped on his horse, raced down the Oil Creek Valley to secure as many leases on farms as he could. He and his partner Brewer subleased lots to other drillers and people came from all over the country, forming their own oil companies or just drilling on their own. By the end of 1859, there were four producing wells in the Oil Creek Valley. By the end of 1860, there were hundreds of wells over on uh, French Creek by Franklin and then up the Allegheny to Titiute, where in December, the first gushers were struck the first oil exported to Europe. 1862, the first exports to Japan. First refineries are built in the area near the oil wells. 1863, we've got Lincoln appointing a consul to Belgium to encourage exports. More and more people recognize the money that can be made from finding a good flowing well. Everyone was after that part of the crude that 
could become kerosene. Uh, one of the first things that everyone realized was that this was a cheap, safe lamp fuel. No longer did the, the crews have to sail away out of the eastern seaboard, go all the way around the, the tip of South America to find whales in the Pacific, kill them, cut them up, boil them down on deck to bring back whale oil and bone for fertilizer. We could now get a cheap lamp fuel right here from Pennsylvania. Obviously, there's very few chemists working in this specific area in 1859, 1860. They knew that by heating the crude, different things vaporized at different temperatures. And when it got to be a certain color, that's what they knew of as kerosene. They eventually, late 1800s, could name all the different fractions that came off. But initially, they didn't. They were after the kerosene, so anything after that was thrown away, dumped into the creek. The high end, they soon realized, could be used to pour back down the well to um, melt the paraffin that was gathering on the inside of the pipes. There was one refinery in Pittsburgh, and that was Samuel Kears. But it didn't take long for others to jump in. All over the East Coast, there were coal oil manufacturers making lamp fuel from coal. And it was an easy switch over to petroleum from coal. So some of these coal oil refiners end up moving into Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and this area. By 1862, there were two scientifically advanced refineries in the region. One around which the city of Cory grows, and another one in a small town called Plummer, German chemists. These chemists were able to develop new products for use on the market. Any oil man that tries to use soap to wash their hands will tell you that it becomes thicker and you get this substance we call grease, which can be used to lubricate machinery. The petroleum industry lubricated the Industrial Revolution. And these chemists found out that some of this, that what was left over after pulling off all these other products, could be used to find new dyes, new colors, which could then be added to clothing. A new dyes had been developed using the coal tar the residue of coal oil manufacturing. So now chemists were applying that same knowledge to what was left over from making kerosene. By 1862, President Lincoln and Congress realized that the North now had a new product that was outrageously valuable. The oil men in West Virginia, when Virginia seceded as part of the South, didn't want to join the Confederacy. They wanted to stay with the Union near the Pittsburgh refineries. So the state of West Virginia is born 1863. They then realize, being politicians, we could tax the exports. And they did so at a dollar a barrel. Now, if you've got wells producing 3,000 barrels a day, multiply that by the hundreds of wells in this region, and you've got funding for the Northern armies. Now the lumbermen had been concerned by slowing demand, but this new industry provides a remarkable new opportunity. Coopers are the ones that make wooden vessels. So wooden buckets, wooden barrels, wooden tanks. Advances in technology often come from supplying the need. Drake didn't have enough barrels to put his oil in, so we get coopers moving into the area. But a skilled cooper, it still takes a day to make one barrel. And when you've got a 1,000 barrel, 3,000 a day wells, you need a lot of coopers. So then machines are invented and developed to make barrels faster. 
But a barrel of oil doesn't move itself. Transportation was the major obstacle for oil producers in the very early years of the industry. Pittsburgh's a long way away from here, but the waterways were navigated by the lumbermen who knew their way. So you could load the barrels onto rafts and then float it down Oil Creek, down the Allegheny to Pittsburgh refiners. All the lumbermen up and down the Allegheny, as well as up and down Oil Creek, had mill ponds where you could drag the logs down the hillside and then float them in the pond to then be brought up to the mill to be sawn. These mill ponds could then be opened, creating a flood of water on Oil Creek, which would raise these lumber rafts, or later the barges full of oil barrels, up and they could then float down to the Allegheny River. Or you could load six barrels, roughly, onto a wagon, take it over the muddy, muddy roads to the junction of two railroads in what becomes the city of Cory. Even now, if you won't go on a dirt road in northwestern Pennsylvania in the spring, they're muddy and they're full of potholes. The same was true then. But now you're multiplying it by hundreds of Teamsters, wagons each loaded with barrels of oil and all that weight and the horse's hooves going up and down this road every day, going to the nearest railroad or to the nearest refinery. So if you've got a thousand barrel well, a wagon can fit six barrels, do the math. That's a lot of wagons and horses up and down these roads, which becomes so muddy that then it becomes a big joke. 1862, you've got the beginnings of the Titusville Oil Creek Railroad from Cory down to Titusville, and by 1866, all the way down the valley to Oil City. Oil men like me were too busy trying to get rich to actually move any oil ourselves, so that fell into the hands of Teamsters, a term that referred to anyone driving animals to pull a wagon. Teamsters were coming from all over. Uh, first of all, you've got all the farmers that have horses and wagons, so they're the first Teamsters. But soon, you've got wagon builders building new wagons. Again, there's a need. People are gonna fill that need. So you could buy a wagon or get a used one. Any young man looking for a job could then be hired by a well operator to be a teamster, or you've got people that own their own wagon and horses entering the business. And the wells could be anywhere. It's not like we knew what we were doing. We were dropping wells wherever we could. There were no geologists that had ever really studied petroleum. Geologists knew it existed, but people specialized in things like coal or fossils or rivers. So the science of petroleum geology grew as wells grew. We learned as we went along, and sometimes that came at a painful price. With the first flowing wells, the first gushing wells, again, caused by gas pressure, no one expected it, no one knew what to do. Oil was flying everywhere. And no one realized that with the gas, you can have explosions. 1861, we've got the first major explosion with many men getting burned to death and dying. Despite the danger, the appetite is huge and more people are seeking more opportunities for more wells on more land. Um, the United States Petroleum Company was formed in Plummer, which is near Pithole, by um, Mr. Frazier, Faulkner, and others. And they're the ones that purchased part of the land, the land option, leased it, from Thomas Holmden for oil well drilling. In 
And if you're wondering why they took an interest in this hilltop stretch of land, because Thomas Holmdom talked and him into it. <laughs> Thomas was a smart man. He made a fortune from this once valueless land. He was a kind man, too. He and Walt had a third brother, John, who died. Thomas became guardian to John's kids and set them up with the modern equivalent of half a million dollars in bonds. Just one of many kind acts in his life. The men that came to drill in Pithole uh, formed their company in the summer of 1864. They then started leasing. They leased part of the farm, about 160 acres, from Thomas and Walter Holden, divided it up into lots, leased another lot to Kilgore and Keenan. And so two wells, or three, were begun in the summer of 64. Both came in in January. They then laid out a town. Lots were leased. By September, you've got roughly 15,000 people living in the greater Pithole area. 54 hotels and boarding houses in Pithole City alone, with another 21 within a mile. You've got nine drug stores, 18 physicians, uh, cooperage houses. Um, everything a community needs in order to live. Cooks, chambermaids, entertainment houses, theaters, restaurants, machine shops, foundries, blacksmiths. Pithole is a phenomenon with its growth and activity. You've got two streets worth of buildings being built in a couple of weeks, and more continually happening. One hotel was started in the morning and was occupied by 10 to 15 guys that night. It's it, the rapid growth is, is amazing. And then you've got 15,000 people in the greater Pithole area by September of 1865. Now, many people might raise an eyebrow over the ability to build a town that fast, but we had our ways. One of the construction methods developed, maybe for boom towns, was called balloon frame construction, where you build the wall on the ground and then raise those walls into place. That's what enabled Pithole to begin to grow so fastly for buildings to be built so quickly. In other words, they weren't well made. By 1865, real estate developers realized that instead of trying to engage in the risky business of oil production, you could gain a lot of money by buying and leasing land. So you've got a developer across Pithole Creek that develops Prather City one up the creek that develops Ball Town, and another not as successful called Dawson Center. You've never seen anything like it. The buildings going up, the hustle and bustle of everyone trying to get in on black gold. It's an incredible sight. So all the global output of oil came from this region. With the first wells in the late 1860, and then others in 61, producing 500 or 3,000 barrels of oil a day. By the time Pithole gets going, with it, the height of its oil production, two-thirds of the output of oil for this country came from Pithole. And it's making some people very wealthy. Well, oil is referred to as black gold. It, it go, goes back to uh, property owners and leasing mineral rights to oil companies in the hope that oil is developed on their property and they would get big, fat royalties. And when it came to the Holmden brothers, one of them did just that with astonishing success. So you've got Thomas Holmden, 
who reserved a quarter of the oil in his lease to the United States Petroleum Company. So any of the oil produced on the lands of the United States Petroleum Company, a quarter of it goes to Thomas Holden, who then moves to Cleveland, becomes a real estate developer, and ends up on the City Council of Cleveland. Nice and easy for him. Not so straightforward for the rest of us. So you've got a, a farm that then is leased to a company, an oil company, that then subdivides that farm into lots, drilling lots, sometimes an acre, sometimes a half acre, sometimes a quarter acre. So then you've got operators coming in and buying leases for X number of dollars for X number of lots. Then they have to buy the tools, they have to buy the lumber to build the derrick, they've got to hire the experienced driller, they've got to dig down to bedrock, begin the drilling process, three feet a day for wells that are anywhere from 250 to 650 deep or deeper. Then you've got to buy the barrels, you've got to produce the oil and find a buyer then to buy that oil. When you've got all of that capital invested in an oil well, you're then at the mercy of the refiners. How much are they going to pay you for that oil? The refiners are at the mercy of the market. What's the demand? What's the federal government taxing per barrel of oil? It's a dicey situation becoming an oil producer. Oh, well, now she tells me. Chronicles was made possible thanks to a community assets grant provided by the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, Spring Hill Senior Living, support by the Department of Education, and the generous support of Thomas B. Hagen. This is WQLN.